Okay, hi, I'm Betty Linsinger. I'm the director of multilingual writing uh, at Bryn Mawr College, and I'm just here this morning to introduce Leslie Scusen, who is from the Princeton International School of Mathematics and Science, which is a high school in the sponsorship of Rinmin University in Beijing. Uh, she teaches history there. Her PhD is in history from uh, University of Wisconsin, yay. And um, she's also the e-learning consultant for the school. Uh, if you go on their website, you'll see that she also does the scheduling and transcripts for the school. So she's like totally <laughs> knows how to run an entire school. Um, uh, so she manages their online platform and um, She's going to uh, talk to us today about using blended learning techniques uh, for, I think, multi-level, um, a multi-level classroom, and that not just in terms of language, but in any way that uh, you, you know you experience diversity in the classroom. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting, I feel almost like my description is like, that's not all there's for. We also work for Southern New Hampshire University and a couple other online schools and Rutgers University and Rutgers Prep Innovation Center. Um, so we do a lot of online outreach, uh, especially with international students. Uh, we're creating a program to prepare international students for education in the United States by giving them interaction in English in a more American casual style instead of the strict lecture test, lecture test. <laughs> anyway, um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, there are a couple different levels to this workshop. So um, we're going to start off by uh, doing a sort of introduction to some different levels of online tools. Uh, this is so that if, you're, if you've never done this before and you want to take a first jump, you might get some examples. Um, if you've done this before, that's not fine too. I'm sure it's a refresher. And we'll end up We'll end with a more practical application where we create an online module for a blended situation and uh, give each other feedback on that. So, um, for this, <coughs> so if you have computers, this would be helpful. If you go to lessonscousin.com, I have an e learning tab. And uh, if you hover over that, there's a Brimmer conference drop down. Uh, that's where I put all of my links for the different interactive portions so that you don't have to sit there and write, you know, business.com backslash. Yeah. Does anyone have a second pin at their I, that they I don't use? use? Thank you. Oh, the bottom one. Thank you. I'm sorry. Great. We're going to start off with some polling about you, just so that we have a better sense of um, who is in this room. So uh, so if you are on LeslieScouse.com and the Bryn Mawr Conference, you'll see that there is a link that you can do on your computer or you can do on your phone. If you text Leslie Scalza 241-237607, you can join this conversation and text back and forth, with which the students love. But what I really love is that you can also do it by the more friendly interaction of the computer, um, which keeps students from going from interacting with you to texting other friends, which they could do online anyway, but it's, can you repeat the previous steps? Because I, I didn't find the previous one. Uh, would it be fine if I showed you? Yes. When you go to lessonscouting.com, it looks like this. Yes. And if you go over e-learning, oh, framework e conference. Up there. It's going to make a poll everywhere. Link. And you can just click this link, and it will open up the poll. So we, um, we are to get into yours, we text Leslie Skousen. Um, it's, they drop the N for whatever reason, so Leslie Scalza, 241. Okay. 241, and then who is the recipient? What is your number? Uh, it is 37607. Or you can click on the poll link itself and just type in your responses. Sorry, can, sorry I, I still I can't get to your page. Can okay. you go back? And sure. So uh, have you got to LeslieScouser.com? Yes, I did. All right, and you saw it with my silly picture there? Yeah. Um, and then if you hover yeah, over e-learning, Bryn Mawr Conference appears. Yes, yeah. I'm there. And then you click on that? Yes. And it should say Bryn Mawr Blended Conference. Yeah. Oh, right. And then if you just click on this link, and oh, okay. then it'll take you straight to 
this. And then you can answer. If you use this in your classroom, on the first day, there's always about five minutes as people like try to get in and there are a few problems. Uh, but after that, it runs really smoothly and kids these days, they pick it up like that. I use this all the time. Do you, have you purchased it or do you just use the free one? I use the free one. I use the free one. Yeah. All my classes are really small. Me too. And it's, but I know that there's so many enhanced tools in this, but yeah. I also love this. It has it. enhanced, while well, people are getting in, I'll just say this. Um, it has enhanced uh, participation to an extraordinary degree in my classes because it allows people to respond to things completely anonymously, yeah. which, which when some of my more reticent uh, students, when they see that they're actually part of an overwhelming majority, um, they, uh, they, they might participate then. Yeah, this is especially true of my students from Beijing because they are so cautious. They know the English so well, but they're really cautious about raising their hand and possibly mispronouncing a word. So they hold it in. But with this, they know how it's spelled, and so they're much more likely to participate. Same with my shy students or my deep thinkers, because while everyone's sort of fumbling with their phones, they have that minute to really think deeply about what they want to do. Sometimes it's also really good, it's really good discussion to start with. Yes. So people may say some silly things that people will be more relaxed and start like really confused about what they think. Yes, that's a really great thing. So, so usually how I start this, I don't start with an A, B, C, D. I start with, um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And I leave it open answered, uh, or open ended rather. Uh, and that way they just say whatever they like. Yeah. And frequently they'll say silly things. Yeah, I know. And then, <laughs> you know, but then I've learned too quickly that I can't let too many open ended go in there. Yeah. They'll start writing, Dr. Skousen is wearing a skirt. And you're like, why did you write that? I don't understand. <laughs> so uh, it looks like we have a lot of experienced teachers in here. Uh, I was sort of expecting sort of the, the younger generation fresh out of grad school. Uh, so this is really great. Um, and I'm looking forward to see what we have in the different experiences because I'm sure there's stuff that I have that you haven't used, stuff that you have used, and stuff that you have that I've never heard of. So that should be great. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on to our next poll. So as soon as you hit next and activate the next question, the previous question is deactivated. So you don't have people answering multiple questions at once. And if you want to get rid of that annoying thing on the side, yeah, the it's the thing with the four arrows going at that bottom thing, you can go slightly to the left, push your cursor slightly to the left, a little to the left. Sorry, left. Yeah, and now a little bit up. This? Right there. Yep. Oh, yeah. thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome. And then you can say aloud, and then there, and that'll just disappear yeah. in a second. I know it's we live and learn, right? It's so awkward though because it's definitely cutting off. Yes. Aside, this is my every time I plug it in, it's a different configuration. All right. So we don't have anyone who is just one of those online all the time people. All right. Um, but it seems like. There's a nice blend here, which is which is pretty cool. Um, for those of you who have taught online a few times, did you find the experience to be like surprisingly well organized, or was it chaotic? <clears throat> Nobody wants to admit that uh, there. <laughs> well, so I, I'm one of those people, but I actually didn't know whether I should say that or the um, blended or flipped classroom model. Really, um, I've um, I've mostly taught online. Once I've taught through distance learning other times, but actually when uh, live face to face, gotcha. um, and um, you know it just takes a lot of time up front. So um, that's so how much time you put up front depends on how organized it is. I guess I mean it. I think it can depend just like any other classroom. Right. Right. Um, and but I I basically consider now my traditional teaching to be hybrid class. Any traditional? Yeah, it's because very I because I, I use Moodle really, really happily. Yeah. yeah. And and other tools like Turnitin and stuff. Right. I actually thought about using Turnitin for today's interactive just because it's so easy to comment inside things. It's pretty wonderful. Um, I don't ever use Turnitin for plagiarism checking. In fact, I just use it for all of the cool comment tools and connecting it to different links and so on. So, so I use it for peer review, which is another. Yes. Um, 
So, and I do use it for plagiarism check, but I let students upload ahead of time so that they can learn and correct their right. Good stuff. Who's that hand over here? I still can't get into your page. Really? Leslie, yep. HTTP. Uh, you know, there's no www, right? So it's just lesliescousin.wix.com. Oh no, lesliescousin.com. Oh no. And it redirects. Okay. And you don't need the HTT or anything. Okay. LeslieScousin.com. Yeah. Here we go. Thank you. Hi. All right. So most people are, are using Flipped. And I think you're right. There's, there's very much a, a common component that at least homework's going to be posted online or the reading or something like that. Um, those of you teaching in a physical classroom with no online component, does that include things like homework assignments, like it's just lecture or something along those lines? I don't, I, I've used all three. I, I, I was with Laurel on this. I didn't know which one to choose. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I also teach classes where the only online components using Moodle, Moodle, sorry, yeah. Moodle, uh, long days, right? Um, as kind of just a repository of, of, of papers that you would need. Uh, there's no real in integration or, or component. It's just this way I don't have to print everything. Yeah. So, so I would probably chalk that up to A. But um, I would too. Uh, if you're using like interactive websites in class together, where you're all sitting at your computer in the same space, I think that's more of a blended or flipped. And I think that's uh, like when I say a physical classroom, the online component part is sort of a side of homework. Um, yeah, I would say also that I'm A, B, and C because I have taught complete online courses uh, where the students never come to the campus. Um, but I do use a blended or flipped classroom as much as I possibly can and try not to lecture and have the students do other things and come in and we do activities and we do all kinds of things. Um, my, my subject matter lends itself to that, but I've also taught in uh, like scholar seminars where we use very little, we have a lot of this sort of the setup discussion around the table um, with maybe the most that I would use the online uh, component is just as, as you were saying, sort of done it as a repository for things like the syllabus, different rubrics that I might use and certain um, resources that they, they might have available to them. So right. I've, I've kind of, but I've been doing this for a long time, so I've kind of run the gamut. It's interesting, a lot of the things, a lot of the activities that I do with flipped classrooms, I can't really actually imagine at the grad school level because half of grad school is fighting, right? It's, it's like tearing other scholars apart and then rebuilding and, and all of that. And um, I feel like there's an energy that we need face to face there. Uh, and I haven't really thought of that before you said that. Yeah. But I, I started to teach online in 1999. And at that time, we had our own platform in the in, in GIT. Mm -hmm. um, so, and um, since then, I have taught hybrid courses and if, but any face to face that I have taught, I had to use basically the, the LMS to make sure that, you know, I mean, I had always in, included it and made it web enhanced classroom. Right. And I think that was the only way that I could have done um, taught uh, basically uh, practice the active learning because by hosting the lecture, I don't believe that the classroom time should be wasted for giving the lecture um, because if you use you know PowerPoint with voice over it uh, students can look at the lecture many times and then you can use the classroom time for discussion absolutely and any other active learning activity and this is especially important for our English language learners because so often I will use a word that is very common to me but has not been taught as a formal part of learning English so they immediately go to their translator app or to their computer, they look up that word and they miss five minutes of lecture, of discussion, of instructions. And um, this is the biggest problem I found uh, with my English language learners. Uh, at first, it's overwhelming to them. Like every other sentence, they're looking up words and they miss so much. But if there's a recorded lecture with closed captions at the bottom, they can read along. They're more likely to recognize the roots of a word and guess what it means and keep moving. Um, then if you speak it, especially if you have an accent different from the teacher who taught them English. 
Um, yes, one more thing for yeah. uh, ESL students, because I was with ESL when I was listening. It is, it is really helpful to listen to lecture a few times. Right. You know, and learning the otherwise most of your time in the classroom is going to be wasted over, you know, thinking about what that word means, what they mean, she mean, uh, and that's not thinking of the deeper yeah. concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone here rely on lecture? Uh, yeah. Most frequently, I lecture to large groups or I lecture to small groups. I do discussion format or I misspell online. <laughs> I use the discussion format yeah. and I always get started with, you know, I mean, even if I want to give a lecture, I come up with certain questions and we started discussion first and then they I let them to see the PowerPoint. Right. Is anyone answering this one? I think the poll did it lock. There you go. That explains it. Yeah, last year when I was teaching at the University of Illinois, it was uh, a class of 200, and their expectation was that I would go in and lecture. Um, and I found that really stifling because I was used to all this interactive stuff and in classes of a variety of sizes, and uh, and going in two days every week and just lecturing to this large group was extremely frustrating. Um, since then, I've realized a lot of things I could have done differently, to, even with a large group, to still make it interactive. <laughs> but it seems like nobody in here is doing the introduction to psychology class with 400 undergrads in a big lecture hall. I, I have to. I've, I've been there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you can, I think again, you can, you can blend the two, uh, kind of a, a collaborative based lecture, um, where, where you're giving information, but every so often, right, I mean those 20 minute intervals because you're only going to keep attention for 20 minutes, right? Yeah. So those 20 minute intervals, you're, you're using that discussion rather than a discussion based format. So I, I don't know where, where, where we were drawing the line um, to I either. Do. When I'm creating my lecture notes, and you know, some people do like full on essays that they read, but you know, I do lecture notes and then every four or five points, I have a research question that I ask them to crowdsource. And then we, uh, they can post either using something I pull everywhere or if it's, you know, if I don't have that and just old fashioned raising hands. But that way they're doing research, they're engaged, they're adding to my lecture notes, uh, and I'm not just telling them. This is always a good time. So, so in there too, I wanted to choose several. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I do lecture some, I teach biology, and some things like anatomy are not primarily discussion topics. But right. you can still get out phones and have students, you know, look at stuff or, um, uh, you know, but but I I do see lecture as a useful okay. tool on occasion. It's blinking. It's not blinking. It's not blinking. It's not blinking. Do you want to be here in there? Yes. Um, I'm just gonna think. Let it think for a second. But. Yeah, I used to use lecture a lot more because, like the, uh -huh. the biology or the you know the certain things they seem to need to they need. Um, explanation yeah but one of the things that I found and poll everywhere has been tremendously helpful with that that if I then put a what we call it a formative assessment question mm -hmm. in part way through something that I thought I was really clear on yeah they are not they're not clear on so one of the things that I found is that I require student presenters so yeah. I I require them to do something and then or I'll say okay we've gone through this what I want you to do, and either, and it just takes, you have to move it along though. It has to be, otherwise it could take up too much time. Someone tell me what we just said. Someone discuss what we just said. And then you hear what, and this is also works really well with teenagers in your own home. Okay, now tell me what I just said. And they're, they give you the beginning, they give you the, maybe the end, and they usually miss everything in the middle. And it's, or they only have little snippets of it. And you realize, wow, I thought that was really clear. It was up on the board, but they're still not getting it, or they're still not. Go ahead, look at your notes. What did we say? And um, you know, it's it's. I actually, I actually do doodle polls to have students sign up for graphs to present ahead of time, right. and that's great because it means one, they look at the graphs they can choose ahead of time. Um, when they're choosing, and so I think it gets them to interact with the material a little bit. Like, can I present this? And then I'm uh, glad to hear you talk about formative yeah. assessments. We're going to actually brainstorm different ideas of formative assessments. Um, 
so I just wanted to get an idea. I have one more question after this the word cloud just to see what specific discipline we have. Um, is it mostly humanities or is it just the six people who answered? Oh, we can, we can move on. It's really not important. Um, <laughs> all right. All right, so I want to talk about the online forum, um, especially for English language learners. I mean, yesterday uh, I was part of a presentation on uh, a sort of dynamic, more visual online forum. Uh, and this, this forum, students could, I just want to draw it real quick. Like there would be an original post here, and then students could reply to it, and their reply would be here, and then another student could reply and go there, they could reply to this one. And it looked really cool, but also very confusing. And the forums that I tend to use, um, that many of you probably use if you're using Blackboard or those standards, you have the first one here, and then there's there, there, and you can answer that one, and it becomes layered. Um, and I think it's just a slightly more linear way to have complex, dynamic conversations. What I love about this, about forums in general, to the point where I almost hate physical interaction now, <laughs> is because when there's a conversation going on, like you guys began talking to each other, and I had something I wanted to say as well, but because of the way time works, I couldn't just talk over you. You can totally talk over each other in an online forum. Um, and this is especially important for those shy students, the deep thinkers who take some time to really craft what they want to say. Um, and even those students, I have a wonderful student named Solomon who answers every question that I ask before I'm, I, I'm not even done asking the questions. He's already talking. Um, when he takes on my courses, he has to stop and wait for other people and then be able to respond. So, um, the instructor is able to scaffold the question and monitor the conversation without having to have this great big presence in the classroom to make sure that people obey the rules and aren't mean to each other. You know, if someone starts to go off uh, and get hostile or something, you can delete or edit the thread, which is um, not something I like to do very often because of censorship, but when people start getting heated, I can step in and, and say something about it. Um, each, each thread, so you can have a single question with like 17 different answers and all of the same students are having that discussion instead of just three answers and then let's move on to the next question. And then um, finally, the, the layered communication that I was talking about. This is really good for our adult learners. I have so many students who are, um, you know, they've got five kids or two jobs, that sort of thing. And, and so having this asynchronous interaction, they, they don't miss the classroom experience so much. Um, benefits to this, I think we're all pretty clear on that. Um, multiple dynamic discussions. Um, there's a wider range of concepts. You're able to give the students a list of concepts that you want them to bring in, and they're able to sort of tag each of those throughout the conversation in a way that physically we can't quite do, just because of the restrictions of time. And this is uh, Repeatedly, I've seen this benefiting my English language learners. I have a student right now who's taking two classes with me. One is a history class, and one is an American government class. The American government class is online, and the history class is face-to-face. -face. He has a D plus in the history class because his spoken English is so poor, but his written English is excellent, and he has an A minus in my American government class. He checks in every single day of the week, seven days a week. He posts all sorts of things about key concepts, brings in links. He can't do that in class. I mean, he struggles, and he starts to raise his hand, and he's not sure. Um, and I feel like uh, Gavin like symbolizes the different mediums and how you can access the students. Um, so this brings me to my online course design. Uh, something that I do a lot of, I, uh, I do course design for uh, Southern New Hampshire, and I go into schools and help teachers scaffold their classes. So I find that an online module typically should have five components to it. Um, and these components are going to be different from a physical or blended classroom. Sometimes this seems a bit full. Um, but content delivery, you know, uh, traditionally we have lecture, content delivery can be a great variety of things, um, videos and reading and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I have found that if I don't include a formative assessment directly after mm -hmm. the content delivery, they're going to they're gonna completely dump 
the great majority of what they just learned. And this has already come up in our conversation because when we have lecture, we find that immediately afterwards they don't really remember what was just said. Um, and, and how common is that, right? I mean, it's so easy to come to lecture and to be there and to sleep through it, but you were there. I never missed a day of class, right? Uh, it's the big problem with passive learning. Um, so the formative assessment is, uh, I think, crucial to immediately after the, the content delivery. And then something that I do always is an interactive activity that is not necessarily graded. Uh, this can include um, searching online for an example of a key concept, finding an image, interpreting an image, um, having them, uh, I saw a great presentation yesterday on selfies and literature, having them take a picture that symbolizes the themes of the novel that you've just read and then describe them. It was a wonderful idea. Uh, that sort of thing. So they really, they take this abstract content, maybe they just had a, a formative, just a basic quiz to make sure they've got it so far, or, you know, let's define what is power, right? Something like that. Uh, the interactive activity lets them make it their own. And then the discussion forum. I find the discussion forum to be the, the heart of every module. Because without discussion, there's no social component. There's no sense that you want to make sure you don't embarrass yourself in front of your peers, let alone your instructor. This interaction, um, follow, following different threads to their logical conclusions, or in the best case scenario, no logical conclusion with everyone's preconceived notions sort of upended, right? Those are the best conversations. Um, maybe not in biology, but they are in <laughs> history <laughs> when we ask. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then finally, a summative assessment. Um, this contrasts, I think, with a blended module in that the formative assessment might be optional. You might say, tonight your reading is blank and come to class ready to answer these three questions. And that could be a formative assessment or come to class ready to talk about your idea of gender roles in 21st century America, whatever. Um, the interactive activity sounds like what most of us are already doing in the classroom. Either, uh, you know, some sort of interactive uh, the images, uh, something with, this is where blended can really help because the interactive activity can be online while we're all in the same space. Discussion forum online would be optional, but in a blended classroom, we almost always have discussion, like in the actual class itself followed by a, for, a summative assessment. And the way I do this, I like to have one module per week, but in a college course, that means 16 modules in a row, and that can get really repetitive. Um, so I usually break them down into units of three to five modules each. So there's, um, you connect the different modules and have some unit project at the end. So at this point, um, I'm gonna go to Padlet. Has anyone here used Padlet? All right, Padlet is like Pinterest, but for education. Um, and I really enjoyed Padlet. And I thought we could do a series of examples of content delivery and that sort of thing. So if you go uh, to my page, I have four Padlets set up. So you can click on content delivery examples. And what's great about this is once you have this link, anyone can post Padlet. So you can double click there. Uh, since this is all anonymous, I'm going to say Skousen is my title. Um, that way we know who wrote what. And then say reading assignments online. So content delivery example. <laughs> so you can add your own. Uh, I think reading is probably the one that we do. So myself. can you, uh, I, I can follow that. How did you get there? Uh, if you go to my website. Yeah. And then click content delivery examples. Yeah. It should automatically open the okay. tablet. Great. And then if you double click, a text box appears. And you can create your own. What I'm hoping here is that we'll come up with some things that I've never heard of or that some of you have never heard of and we'll be able to brainstorm some ideas. What are your favorite methods of content? So we write our names in it. No. Yeah, I mean, if you, if, I, I would like it that way since it's an anonymous forum. So how do you, oh, you just double click? Double click, mm -hmm. and then up top in red, you can put your name, and then uh, what you'd like to say. And then I can move them as we sort of over 
So there are a lot of cool features about Padlet. I didn't go through all of them. You can create a background, and you can um, have them automatically line up with each other in terms of strips, the way Pinterest is. Um, it's really great for brainstorming ideas. So is this free? Or? It is free, yes. Mm -hmm. It's free, and the only person who has to create an account is the administrator. So I created an account, but all of you can do online or anonymous posting. So if it suits me to a computer or a, a, um, an iPad, uh, yes. Can you do this? Can you go over the three functions? I could we click on it, I see a link. You can paste the, the link. Uh -huh. Or you can uh, uh, I'm so three functions, but I now we don't see them. Oh yes. Or you can uh, you can drop a file. Right, you can post images there. Or you can uh, I have found with my students that uh, if I talk about the images, then the images I get are not always germane to the discussion. <laughs> um, so I mostly just use uh, the text. Um, and then also, uh, if anyone you know were to post like a, a bad word or a, an inappropriate comment, um, if you hover over them, I can delete anyone. Um, so that's just a nice, if something unexpected goes up there, you have the control to end it. Uh, but I really like this because whether it's small groups or it's a very large group, you have this interaction, but it's silent. So we can keep talking while people are answering a specific question. Um, and then if you want to make this for a grade, something I have done is when we're done with it, I do a screenshot, and as long as everyone's names are there, then I can give them a sort of participation grade. Or, um, or you know, if, if I require them to write three or four lines, then I can actually do a sort of substantive interaction grade where... I give the, the best comment, the highest grade, that sort of thing. So do you do this in class or the I do it in, it is in class or actually it's outside the class? Do do so this is a synchronous tool. Um, it, well, I suppose it could be asynchronous. You could just leave it open for a certain number. But I've always done it in real time. Um, so my high school is a research center. We bring professors in to present their research. And I'm required to present innovative research about once every six weeks. So we invite people from the community, so people come sometimes from Princeton University or Ryder, which is nearby, or Drew University, which is about an hour away, um, Rutgers, that sort of thing. And so I frequently give these kinds of lectures uh, to a variety of people. Our students are in the audience, but so are professors from Princeton, which is always you know, intimidating. Um, and so using something like this is a way that no matter who shows up the presentation, I can have an interactive idea and I can present something, I can say, uh, what are the primary functions of punishment, because I'm a legal historian, and, and before I present I can give a, a sense of how people think about punishment throughout history. Um, I'm struggling um, yeah. in the concept. Yes, for the large group, if you have 100 students and you want them to have a brainstorming you know, like this, and then it's great because you are not asking 100 students to go up there to grab for and write down things, you know, will be a disaster in a way, right. right? But if you only have 10 students, for example, and you have a classroom like this, yeah. a breadboard, and actually, I kind of like us students to go up there and then write down something on the breadboard in a very traditional way, so I don't... What do you so find, uh, what is it that you like about that interaction? Um, it's different, for example, writing with hands, especially when I teach Chinese characters. Yeah. Right? Um, it's different when you ask them to go there and then they write with their hand and then you need a stroke orders and then uh, it's, it's a very different way of learning Chinese language uh, from typing and writing with pen and pencil in the hands. The kind of combination, right? Especially with Chinese yeah, characters. Yeah, so but I wonder if that would be the same thing if you were teaching French, or you know, um, if uh, I, I imagine that Arabic would have a similar <laughs> issue. Right. Ooh, right. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. so this, is, this is the classic debate of impersonal versus personal right, computer right. mediated communication. Well, I I, I right. So I mean, if if you need that personal need, that that chalkboard provides that 
experience, that touch, the kinesthetics, right? And all of that that you want them to be able to get out of that character, right? Mm -hmm. um, for for what, what we're doing here, it provides an impersonal medium right. where you can be apprehension free about what you're writing because you don't even need to write your name and you right. still need right. to get input. Right. So I, I think they're, they're and yet, while we're good writing, ideas. We are having this conversation, which if we were brainstorming audibly, we would not be able to have this conversation. So what I like about this is the students can keep focusing on what they want to say while we continue to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I teach on these too. I think uh, it's it's a great alternative tool for our yeah. handwriting exercise because students might get bored with handwriting all the time. Right. Plus, practice typing in Chinese is a great. It, it's it's very useful nowadays because everybody just type, you know. And then also this could be some warm up warm up activity or some game practicing, you know. Especially in my classroom, I have local students in the classroom. I teach face to face. I also have business students where I see them via the co uh, video conferencing from the big screen. Right. So it's perfect for my classroom if I have some small activities, you know, and everybody can just type in their ideas right there. Sure. You, you know, know another, yes. another yes. thing that might be good for this is um, chalkboard. Um, there are a, a bunch of whiteboard, it turns your iPad into a whiteboard and you can draw Chinese yeah. characters mm -hmm. and then you can save it and post it to this and we can compare everyone's mm -hmm. design. Um, so whether everyone's literally in the same classroom, or you have a sick student who's hatching in from home, or you have more of an online learner learning situation with video, and then you have these kinds of tools so that you're working in a space together, yeah. um, it really just gives you a lot of options. Mm -hmm. I think maybe it's the purpose, the different purpose. You know, I, I, yeah. I think I would use this for like the introduction day, and, and, it, and, it, and it might sound oh, strange, yeah, but yeah. just having students Put their picture up with their name so that I can reference it later seems to be that like magical link that I've never discovered before <laughs> um, where you know we generally ask them to upload their Moodle picture but then I have to go through Moodle and then I have to, and it, yeah right and it's a selfie from you know 2008 and so yeah it, 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 some more than others like, no. so this seems like a really good way to kind of even be able to distribute kind of a directory of your classmates in a way but, outside but, of but learning I mean, anything. I mean, with any tool, I think you need to think about when right. is the best time to use it. Because, I mean, I right. was thinking it's even potentially useful occasionally to have students go up to the board just because having that practice yeah. going up and speaking in front of people is something that can be a useful skill. Um, that is, you know, a skill you might want to develop in your classroom and that, you know, actually physically going to the board and drawing something or answering something might be the best way to develop that particular skill. But, yeah, um, I, I love this. Yeah, Thank I you. have had a lot of fun with this. Uh, and I love this idea of just oh, a way of- I know, Captain. Okay. Yeah, so can you save this? Like, if, um, Yes, you can. Um, I guess you could just print You can at least screenshot it, yeah. yeah. You can screenshot it, but it can also go down further. So it can be bigger than the screen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and in that case, there is a way, uh, which I can't remember right now, but I think it's in the modified tool. At any rate, there's a way that you can save it as a PDF and then scroll down it and go up. I mean, I can, I can export it to a PDF, an image, yeah. Excel, CSV. I can email it. I can post it to Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's the little box with the arrow, right? So that'll give you all your access. Yeah, I think it can also be uh, very useful when you have class discussion and you divide the class into yeah. groups. Yeah. And you say, at least my problem often is that I don't have time to do this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I mean, so I use note cards a lot in my physical class for like minute papers or what what did you understand? What is your money's point? And this would be a great way to do that where they would all, you know, and then I asked people to share, but this way they could all see all their answers. And yeah. So I like that. Yeah. A lot of college professors include like a 10% participation grade or something. And it's always a, a debate. How do you actually measure participation? This is a quantitative way that you can measure participation. Throughout the course, I had 30 assignments that were in class involving this. I had screenshots or a PDF of all of them. And you just get full five points for each one. And the whole thing could be worth like two overall percent points or something like that. You know, and it's just uh, to the kids, they're like, oh, I need those two percentage points, you know, and they're, they're doing it. But, um, but it doesn't add to your grading load, which I think is all of our goal. <laughs> If you look, you can even have a Q code on there. Um, so if you click on the export, you can either embed it, so you'd be able to embed it directly into Moodle. Right. Right. Um, so you'd be able to have it right in there. Um, down there's a Q code, so wherever you are on your PowerPoint, um, you literally just have your students take out their phone or their computer and, and, and take a shot of it, and it'll bring them right to, to Padlet. No typing, no clicking otherwise. And, and I guess the only disadvantage is for students who maybe only have a traditional phone, but you could sure. still let them write it down on a card or something. I have students have. like that um, because uh, my students, I have students of ages 11 to 19, yeah. but my students under 13 uh, are restricted legally from what they can have, yeah. um, and a lot of their parents don't like them to have cell phones yet. Yeah. But that's where the URL makes it all helpful because they can't access it from their iPad or their laptop instead. Yeah. Uh, so, I wanted to ask about Pear Deck, Esther. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Esther. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us about Pear Deck? Pear Deck's really cool. The only downside is that everyone needs a Gmail account, so that's what makes it harder to engage. But if you do it as like a class, like a module kind of for the class, it's really aesthetically really cool, and you can do a lot more. You can have kind of polls, but you can also have people do Padlet kind of things, discussions. You can have people draw, like you can have graphs, like if you're teaching a math class or something, like, oh, draw on this XY axis. You have the XY axis on there, and they can like draw oh, what wow. is a parabola kind of thing, and everyone sees it, and then it's all anonymous. But then for the professor, because um, it's through their Gmail account, you can pull, you have access to all of their information, but it's um, anonymous to the students. Is it free? Um, it's a freemium. So it's like free, the basic functions are free, but then if you want to you get the other more dynamic. Just yeah. Laurel, you can ex export to Excel and sort by name as well. Right. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I like this. I like the digital cards, note cards idea. Do you do you use uh, Nicholas? Do you use a uh, specific? So, um, right now I have students going through Study Blue, and generally we have captains. So each student would take a turn starting to prepare lecture notes in the cards, and they would start at the beginning of the unit, and everybody would have uh, their spot where they have to contribute to kind of the grand study guide of, of, of the class and start creating things. And Study Blue's been good, but I ethically hate it oh. um, <laughs> because it because it, it stays there forever. And so what utility is it if they're just going to go in and look at other people? So Study Blue is a for-profit company in which they take the information the students are using and they keep it in a repository for themselves. And then they work off of people paying money to go on there and basically fetch things that weren't created by their class or their person. So this seems like a way that I would be able to have the class do that while not ceding control to a for-profit organization who's stealing our academic ideas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not to not to soapbox. Yeah. Well uh, actually that's I feel like that leads us into our formative assessment because part of that could be a formative assessment. Um just real quick I did add uh, videos some people like to link to YouTube videos, documentaries, uh, lectures, that sort of thing. Um, you know of course case studies and databases but I love sending them on research missions. You know I call them scavenger hunts but they are doing research and it's wonderful. Somebody wrote research here. Hester, yes. So, um, so let's, let's talk about formative assessment examples. So I already mentioned um, like a pop quiz. So at the very beginning of a lesson formative assessment tends to see what they know. And um, some people start with a formative assessment as the hook into the lesson, 
let's define patriarchy, right? Like, and then you debate over what it really is. Or let's define democracy, right? Um, and that's, that's a great way to get the kids talking, but I, I prefer to do formative assessments right after they've gotten a little bit of information. So I'll give them a scavenger hunt assignment, or I'll give them um, a reading, and then we start with, okay, based on just this reading, what do you know? And sometimes it's just a matter of making sure they actually did the reading. Students have this wonderful habit of opening the book, and literally their eyes touch every page, but they haven't read anything. But because their eyes touch the page, they read it, right? Um, and the multiple choice questions, I'm not a big fan of multiple choice questions in general, mostly because I'm terrible at them. I always get tricked. Um, but it, it, it's that little carrot, right? Um, they get those points and it makes sure that they actually comprehend. Does anyone ever do like an open reaction paper at the beginning of a unit? Yeah. Really short. <laughs> it's really short, yeah, a couple paragraphs. Yeah, that's great for political science because almost yeah. everyone has an opinion about politics. Right, right. This is very um, um, content based. Like for ESL, I think you could do brainstorming reports. Uh, uh, for ESL, you could do um, write another um, conclusive little story uh, or timelines. I mean, but that's for literature. But then everything you know that you're talking about is is pretty content based. Yeah. Um, Later on, I'm going to show you some images from PictoChart. Does anyone ever use PictoChart? I love PictoChart. It's an infographic maker, and sometimes it's a formative assessment. You know, if they just read a story, or um, as a history teacher, I give them, you know, the Iliad to read or something, and then I have them plot out the Iliad in a PictoChart, and you, as you go down the main event, the introduction of main characters, and it makes sure that they've done the reading, but it's also it's got this creative element to it, and uh, students really get into it and start competing with each other about the details. What's the muddiest points? Oh, huh. great. oh. Yeah, yeah. So I just like at the end of the week, um, they have to hand in this week what was something you understood and what was your muddiest point. And then often I can I bring so I do that physically, but I bring those to lab often, and then I'll try to go around lab and check in with people. Okay, you know, are you understanding this now? Um, or I'll hold a review session. And I'll use the muddiest points to, um, you know. Kind of guide my review session and what I or pass on those those points to the tutors. Okay. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, Something else you can do with similar because I love muddiest uh -huh. points also and I used to do it with index cards. Yeah. But I started doing it in poll everywhere where it's an open ended question and then the answers come up either as a word cloud or something. One of the things I like when it on one of the settings in poll everywhere is um, if somebody else text in the same mm -hmm. response, then that word gets bigger. Oh, yeah. So yeah. if you see all of a sudden a huge thing that... Some of my classes are more than 40, and so I... That's going to be plenty of people I say. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, so I have started doing it because we have... Um, our university has clickers, mm -hmm. but um, they were mostly for the education department. Mm -hmm. And so we, I didn't have access to them, but I really liked the pedagogy behind them. So I started using Pull Everywhere. But if you have something, if you, it's not that expensive. If you can, if you can do that. But the handheld note cards are great. But what I liked about Muddy's point on the Pull Everywhere is um, other people were like, "Oh yeah, you're right. I didn't. Have, I had a hard time with that." Or and I said, you know, just you can put a nuance up if you want to do some, you know, part of what somebody else is asking a question about. Definitely do that. Um, one of the other things I do for formative assessment, I will have a basic question in poll everywhere. For example, um, would you use this information? It's just a basic question, and then it would be yes, no, or um, you know, under conditions. Yes, under conditions, or something right. like that, and then. I can put a case, I throw a, a scenario out there, and then I'll ask them, would you use this information? And then students will say yes, and students will say no, and then and you can clear the results of the poll, and then ask the question again, let me change the, the scenario just a little bit. Now would you use the information? And then you can see people say, okay, but what I like about the poll everywhere is you just, 
again, I don't really care who is answering which question. I don't really, I just want to see are they understanding this concept? Um, and using clearing the results is great. Yeah. I, I, I feel that I'm, that I want to use this, but it's, it's missing a piece. This? I, yeah, I, I, I want it, I want the ability to upvote these. Oh. And, and pronounce them. So, like, because a lot of our students, they're, they're going to agree, similar to the idea of the word cloud, and, and it, if we could click on it and upvote it and say, oh. yeah, that's a good point, or, and, 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 and move in some manner, and, and I'm sure you could. Google is, Everywhere has that feature. I, I'm sure you could build it into this, but I, I'm trying to conceptualize how you how you get there using well, it might be interesting is if you started with this to get people's ideas out there and then you see something that's sort of recurring a lot and then you go to a poll everywhere and give them the chance to upvote that would say have a brainstorm question yes. style mm -hmm. where you open answer uh, you, you have an open answer opportunity and then you can vote up or down when I did this yeah. with my students they just downvoted everything they were, they were being little jerks mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I think your college students would be the paragon of maturity. Yeah, they don't dare. They don't dare be jerks. <laughs> um, do you guys want to do the interactive activity ideas? I'm really excited to see what you have for me there. We got super clinical, super fast. Everyone was either like guns or ACLU. So are you looking, when you say interactive activity examples, are you looking for things that we do with our students or that to get them working as interactive groups? Or? Like an active learning activity. So either them doing research and bringing it back to share or um, there are interactive websites where it almost makes it like a you know, scavenger hunt around the website to learn all this different content. Um, a lot of teachers are fans of specific video games. I have a medievalist historian that has a video game where you build a medieval society. I think it takes a little too much time to get through the different elements of the medieval. Like when I teach medieval history, I just do a sort of lecture with a structure and schedule, and then we do case studies with Germany versus France. That's what I'm saying. Um, spending a whole month playing a video game seems like a lot of time, but the kids love it. There's also an interactive website for witchcraft where you all get identities and then you have to accuse each other of witchcraft and um, that they also love that because somebody unexpectedly gets accused and then they're really fighting back about how godly they are and somebody accuses them of having a birthmark. Find an article related oh, to this. No. <laughs> it went on and off. It was, it, was, it, was, it was just resetting resolution. Oh, I see. You're safe. Thank you. Yes. Ooh, create your own meme. I love that stuff. Yeah, if you can joke as an academic, you've made it. Like if you can tell like a solid academic joke, I feel like you're you're pretty deep in understanding. All of my students, young and my college students who are any, I have a I have right now I have an online student who's 81 years old. He's a great grandfather. Bless my life. Anyway, um, all of these. Different students, they email me memes all the time, history memes. And some of them are really terrible, but I just love that they come across them and they immediately think. Have you had a meme you yet? No, uh, not me. There is a friend. They, uh, I was posting something and they saw that I had been looking at my friend's daughter and somehow they got a copy of, like, I don't know how they found it. They probably saw the URL or something. They created a meme out of her. Um, my friend's daughter is adorable, but in this particular picture, her she looked like a demon. She had this like oh creepy grin on, and her eyes were bright red. Um, anyway, I, I get cards all the time with this demon girl on the front. <laughs> Meme's back. All right, last ca uh, case studies. What cell transport? Oh, oh, well, it's just paper biology. Like, oh, we right. talk about how, like, I'll actually bring stuff in and have people pass it down, or I'll have, you know, I'm talking about how nervous system does muscles, and I'll have larger ropes for bigger nerves and smaller ones for others. And we talk, you know, I have students be muscle cells, and I'm the brain, and, you know, I mean, stuff like oh. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know that's not online again. Yeah, but, right. That's true. Um, um, you probably can call it some kind of 
um, <laughs> I feel like but, but for emails, history, right? you can act things out as well. I know people who you can have people, <clears throat> you know, do scenarios where they're acting out. Absolutely. So I don't know. Uh, does anyone have applications that they really like for this kind of interaction? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll give you some. <laughs> Um, okay, and then finally, summative assessments. We don't necessarily need to do a Padlet for this. Usually, people end with a test or an essay project, a uh, presentation. I'm a big fan of presentations uh, because I have found in the workplace, presenting is more commonly called for than essays or reports. And, and not just my workplace, but yeah. like people with real jobs. <laughs> I found it depends on the stakes, though, how well presentations typically go. Um, you know, 10 minute presentation equal to a 50 minute presentation. It's the depth of understanding there. Is there an activity? Is there some type of presentation medium being used? Is it thought about? Right. So there's differing levels. But you know, it's the most common fear public speaking. So if you can get your students to practice when they're still young, also group try work. Things. Sorry? Also, group work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, um, I'm going to do a, a thing about uh, different tools, different kinds of forum styles, which is great for group work because then not only are they working together, you can see how they are working together. So that one guy who's really shy and is trying not to do any of the work but still gets great at the end, you find that out when all of their work is online and interactive. So there are four form styles that I like. The most is the probably very common, you have a single question, but all 15 students end up having their own answer, and then you have 15 different conversations as a result. Um, these are really fun for me uh, because there's so much history, and I want to tell them all about it. And this way, uh, instead of me just lecturing at them about all the different histories that excite me, I can give them a list of like 10 things to research. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. The seek and share is always a great one because you can have them look for current events, you can have them look for scholarly articles, um, images, anything like that, and then they post that and explain why they chose it or what they learned about it. Uh, and then you follow that up with some secondary questions and the students get feedback on each other. Uh, peer review feedback is always, oh, I think, I love peer review because not only does it give the students a chance to improve a rough draft or something, it also lets them see what others are doing. So the really top-notch students can inspire those students who are struggling a little bit, and um, and then the top-notch students can sort of help the strugglers as they review with each other. And when done with a worksheet, so they you know what exactly what to look for, I really like peer review. Um, with peer review. So frequently, in order to avoid plagiarism, I provide open-ended research questions. So they have to get, submit to me a research question and a proposed thesis statement that may or may not flesh out once they actually do the research, but they need to be thinking from the beginning, what am I arguing? Um, so they review that with me, and then they end up sharing these drastically different historical papers with each other, and while they help each other improve their actual essays, they are just going content crazy, and they almost don't even realize it, you know? Because they're, they're just here like, oh, I'm helping my friends, and I like so-and-so, or whatever. But in the process, they're learning about Japanese internment camps, and uh, internment camps in Shanghai, and all these different things. So, I really like the, uh, anyway, uh, and then we also have debate. So, the first one works best with how or why questions. Um, I, I, when I'm helping other people scaffold their classes of different disciplines, I find that there's frequently an urge to say, what is blah, blah, blah. And every student who sees that, their, their gut instinct is going to be like single word answers. And that does not make for a dynamic discussion. A how and a why question, it really forces them to push the envelope, not just a single sentence or a couple words, uh, but something a little deeper. Um, you can ask them about personal reactions, which is always a little dangerous, but uh, definitions or interpretations. Um, how would you define the main character of this novel? Or uh, I'm going to violate my own, but what were the primary causes of a specific event? You know, uh, of course, I'm going to give you history examples for that one. My uh, discipline. But you, all, I always construct this as a primary prompt and a secondary response with deadlines. 
Um, so I'll say that the first or primary answer is due Wednesday by 9 p.m. And it, we're going to continue this conversation through Friday at 9 p.m. So your primary answer has to be done before Wednesday at 9 p.m. And then that gives them 48 hours to read each other's responses, begin asking secondary questions. And I have a number of posts requirement. So um, you have to comment on at least three classmate threads. But in addition, you have to maintain your own thread. So anyone who posts on your thread, who is a comment or question, you have to answer them. And you can't just say, thank you, or I agree. You have to answer them with something substantive. So they end up having five different grades here. It's a timeliness grade. It's a key concepts grade or a comprehension grade. Um, the number of times they posted. Uh, their engagement, did they actually maintain their thread, that sort of thing. And then finally, just the basic mechanics. Um, were you writing a text speak? Because you're going to get a bunch of points if you are. Yes? Um, so one way that i found that I get better comments is um, when I grade on comments, I say that you can only get full credit for your comment if you. I can tell from your comment that you have read the first post. Yeah. Um, or that you include some additional piece of information. Because I found that sometimes if I don't get much direction, they do tend to be very vague. Oh, I really like reading this. It was very interesting, you know. I definitely um, agree. Kind of yeah, and then I, I actually just don't get credit for this. Yeah. yeah, me neither. In fact, I don't credit uh, if they agree with each other. Um, sometimes I challenge them. I read the similar slide. I challenge them to find someone who, actually, I'll get to that in the paper. Okay. But, <laughs> Um, number two, the seeking share of research. So here I've got what were the causes of World War II? Research at least two of the following for current form sharing. And that way they can go through all these different things. They can choose something. Um, and meanwhile, I'm there so that no species in empires or the civil wars going on in Eastern Europe, I can, I can bring that in in my secondary questions. It keeps going dark. Anyway. Um, so this is really great for current events and tying personal connections in uh, because they, they can have some, like if, uh, if you have majors, different majors in your classroom, they can bring something in that pertains to them and enrich your class that way. Uh, this is also helpful for the English language learners who might start to do their research in their home language and then find something similar in English and be able to post it like that. When you say it's good for tackling large content areas as a group, do you assign different sections of a particular topic? Like you, this group needs to, you know, provide something on this, and this group, you know, sort of a, a jigsaw approach. I do sometimes. It depends. Uh, something like this, though. There's so many websites that are like the top ten causes, and they're going to find a lot of similar content. So I sort of know what to expect. Um, when I did decolonization. Um, I worked with, uh, I, I assigned them specific colonies because if everyone focuses on India, um, you're going to have a very singular conversation and by spreading it across the world, uh, you see how Ireland's um, struggle was very different from Cuba, which is very different from India. So uh, with peer review feedback, um, essays and outlines are a natural opener for that. Um, PowerPoint slides for presentations. Sometimes the students like to get away from the essay um, format. Uh, mostly because they don't like writing. But also, I think that, uh, especially, I think they view PowerPoint and Prezi almost the same way they view certain memes. You know? Um, have, are you guys familiar with Prezi? It's been around for a while. Why is hard to work with? Yes, yes. Uh, the kids love it. It gives me a headache because yeah. you're zooming in and out and all over the place. You also have to find a theme that works for your content, and I think that's going to be challenging. And you have to pay for it if you want to save it past a certain period. Um, the only way for history I've actually found it to be really helpful, and actually it might be helpful in biology in a similar way, mm -hmm. is um, uh, labeling. Uh, so I, for history, I'll do a timeline, and then I'll zoom in to right. 1509 and say Henry VIII comes to power. And you could do something like with a, a body, and you could zoom in and label and that sort of thing. Um, but in general, it gives me a headache. So uh, it's up there. It's an option. I prefer the more stable PowerPoint. <laughs> um, Pictochart, which I'll give you some example. This was actually a formative assessment that I did. Um, we did some um, just preliminary work on Mesoamerican cultures, and then I asked them to brainstorm what we knew about all, all civilizations, which included 
things like all civilizations have politics or religion or geography or something. And then once we put that together, I made them go out and uh, research to plug in all those gaps and create this, um, this overview. Uh, picture chart is free. There, are, there is a paid, uh, a paid element to it. What are you calling it? Freemium. Freemium. Yeah. Freemium, yeah. Um, but I love this stuff. All of this was done, and you can uh, look online for images. They've got all these stock photos. Uh, they have a lot of really great examples. Um, so it's, it's really easy to make. And for students who are doing like science posters, but the science poster is really intimidating. The the amount of information in there is sort of a, a, a light version of that kind of poster. There's also a storyboard. Um, Extra normal recently went down, but it's being saved, so it's offline right now. But it's supposed to be relaunched in, in fall. Or, do you guys know Extra Normal? Um, it's a it's a animation process where you just type in language and movements, and you've got a movie. Kids love it. Um, it's currently down, but it should be back up in a month or two, or by at least this fall. And then Mad Learn. Mad Learn's pretty cool uh, because it's it allows students to create an application for their classes and their content. Um, it, it's really positive for the, almost all kids now are required to be able to do a certain level of computer science uh, programming. Uh, and Madeline lets them do computer programming while also learning about your content and you can have them create an interactive application for their cell phones that, uh, that helps them study for a test. Um, there's also Quizlet, of course, uh, when Nicholas was talking about for-profit. Uh, Quizlet isn't for-profit, but they uh, they do keep whatever quizzes the students make for, for future reference. Uh, so it's that permanence to it. And then finally, debate. So uh, I'll have them do a, a research content reaction post where you know they're researching and then they present what they've learned and then they react to it. So they have to uh, have an opinion-based argument based on their research, with citations, quotes are ideal, um, not just dumping quotes, but a, a very carefully selected quote. And then they have to find two classmates to disagree and post a response that they're interacting with each other and trying to argue their side of something. And then they also find two classmates who agree and try to play devil's advocate. Um, it's just a way to sort of descend into madness because you've seen so much of both sides that you don't have to think anymore. <laughs> And uh, you know, students love to think that they know an answer and they know it for fact. And through this process, they end up losing that that focus and realizing the deep complexity of whatever issue you're focusing on. So, um, do you have any questions? This is the point where I was going to the interactive workshop. Go ahead. Uh, do you or is your uh, PowerPoint going to be up on the website? It should be. Yeah. Great. So many things I couldn't type that down. Well, I can always exchange a uh, business card, but great, send that along. So the, the debate piece for me is always the hardest to get going because I teach all international students from about 70% Chinese. Um, so there's a lot of reticence about concentration and, and, and mm -hmm. language of challenge and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I've tried moving things online thinking that, you know, we're going to solve some of the problems, but it seems to never, when we get to this level, it never seems to quite take off. And I always end up, you know, looking back on it and thinking, well, that was a disappointing discussion somehow. Yeah. Um, the other challenge, and I don't know if this is something you want to talk about at all, or if anybody else has this experience, but I have other students, uh, you know, we always imagine that the students are very techy because they're younger than us. But um, I, every year I have a certain number of students from African countries who have never seen a computer before. They usually get a computer. Um, you know, either right before or right when they get to the United States. So they're learning how to use a computer at the same time that we're asking them to do all of these things with a computer. Right. Um, so I don't know, those are just two of my issues. <laughs> right. It sounds like people like that need to be paired with more experienced students, um, but it's, it's hard to reward those more experienced students and maintain a fair atmosphere. I wonder if the university can help with a, a program. Tech sharing or in 
you know, um, like a texture, a tech buddy or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just think of what you had to deal with this morning. I mean, these kinds of things. Look at this. I thank God I brought my old clunker with me because I had the worst time connecting. I had a nice little Chromebook yesterday that I was working with, and I ended up having to constantly leave and go out into the, the central area to get the web connection back. I mean, I don't think you're alone in that. I think we all, we try so hard, we keep working with different things, so many new things come out, and I've learned, you know, seven new tools today, which have been great, thank you so much. Um, and it's like, wow, I would just love to sit and master now Padlet, Pictograph, you know, all these other things, but oh my God, what am I gonna do at all? Uh, I think this is a constant, uh, well, you're not alone. You're not alone, we all are doing this, we're doing the best we can in the time we have and we just keep trying to share ideas to make it a little bit easier. Um, it's, it's, I think it's, it, it, this is the hard part is to try to find a little bit of time after a class like your muddiest point. For me, it's like, what didn't work today? What did work today? If I can just, and collecting the cards, there's something about, and maybe it's just because I'm old, but the tangible act of collecting cards makes me collect a card for myself and say what worked, what didn't. And I keep throwing those cards in a little pile um, in my, the, my top drawer. And then I look back over the semester and start to say, okay, where do I really, where can I really streamline this? Or I talk to my, my brilliant colleagues like Sohela who know everything and say, okay, I have to be able to do this better. And they'll, they'll tell you. So it's just, I think it's just keep trying to think about it, find strategies that work for helping you reflect on what's good and what's bad, and then talk to each other. I, don't know. I mean, I think you need to think about which tools you're choosing. And sometimes the online ones are best, and sometimes the paper ones are best. I mean, sometimes, uh, like I, one of the things I like about have I don't know, I might go to one of these, but one of the things I like about having the physical money is point cards is I stick them in my backpack and then when I'm like, I can go through those and order them when I am in my car waiting to pick up my daughter from track practice. When I don't have internet access and so I can't easily, so yeah. there, there are actually times when I have five minutes and I can do some small task that's offline and make be more efficient. Okay. And finding yeah. that time, and, and and sometimes you know being online helps you save time and be more efficient with your time. It just kind of depends on the, the situation. Something that I really love, I uh, I, I use Desire to Learn at uh, the school where I set up their LMS, um, and some elements of Desire, Desire to Learn are a bit clunky. Uh, but what I really love about it is they have a locker system where you save stuff to your locker, and then the locker is there whether you've got internet or not. Which is so awesome when you're on a plane and the internet's $30. And yeah. you can just sit there and grade, and then as soon as it connects, it automatically uploads and saves all of the feedback and grades. Um, students can do it too. They can save, um, they can start their forum posts. They can't see what's been updated, but they can start their forum posts, they can read the stuff that's been posted, uh, and, and then it automatically updates. So, and what was that tool you had? Desire to Learn? Oh, Desire that's to learn. It's an LMS. Okay. okay. So, and I wish they had a free version because it's not worth paying $16,000 a year for Desire to Learn. Um, it's cheaper than Blackboard, it's $26,000. Uh, but if I were going to create an entire LMS, I would go with the free version of Canvas or I would pay for something like Final Sight, which is about $6,500 for um, actually a much more smoother so, speaker design. So, so why wouldn't you choose Google? Oh, Moodle. Moodle is the great beyond. The reason why I can't choose Moodle is because I do not have enough tech experience to design it. I would have to hire someone to design it for me, and those services can range anywhere from like a thousand dollars to fifty thousand dollars. And you have to sort. It's not like Moodle has these like approved design people. You have to find someone on your own, and I've yet to find someone who understands Moodle. And now that Moodle's been bought by Blackboard, I'm worried about where it's going to go next. Um, yeah, so, so those are my struggles with Moodle. I'm also using Schoology right now. I'm not sure how much I like mm -hmm. Schoology. I just logged into it a couple of weeks ago for my innovation center and stuff at Rutgers Prep, which is mostly international. Um, there are all these Chinese students who want to get into schools, high schools and colleges here in the United States, 
And so they're, they're trying to do more online prep work so when they get here, their English is perfect and they're ready on day one. But anyway, uh, so we have this interactive workshop. I don't know if it's going to work with like five people. <laughs> um, so we, we could try it, I guess. Um, I, I was going to suggest that we write a paragraph describing recent additional le lessons. And then consider one way that you could widen that audience with blended learning. Um, and then I have a free forums link on my website, and you are going to post your idea there and give feedback for each other. How about this? Raise a hand. Who wants to do this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you have any more um, basically free source, uh, free uh, open sources, you know, that they can use in our classes? Yeah, let's discuss it. Ignore this for a minute. Um, color splash is sometimes good. You can do a lot of image manipulation with that. Um, what's it called? Color splash. Could you show us? Uh, do you have not really. This is something that was just shown to me, so I haven't tried it myself. Color um, splash. Color splash. Color splash. Yes. Color splash. Um, but students who really splash. like splash. splash, splash. I'm just like suddenly panicking because I don't know what's on here. <laughs> um, so oh, I knowledge form was the thing yesterday that looks like this. Yeah. The uh, the picture chart. Yeah. I looked at while we were sitting here. I looked at the um, I looked at the the example, um, is it like Prezi in that you need to find um, a template that works really nicely with yours? Is that, and, do you, and how have you found, because that little coffee versus tea thing, that was a great example of how easy it would be to manipulate one if you found the right format, and that's like a minute and a half if somebody wants to see that. Um, yeah. But do you use this a lot? Is this something that's really helpful to you, do your, or do your students like it a lot? My students love it. Mm -hmm. I showed the students at the, at the Princeton Center, uh, I showed them this for the Olmec thing that I showed you, and then the next time we had a reading assignment, I had two different students come in having made a timeline using this, uh, this tool without me requiring it and then the next week a different student came in having charted out the plot of an origin myth of the um i, I gave him two origin myths one of the aztecs and one of the maya and she had used this to chart the plot and the way she charted the plot it showed right in front of us all the parallels um and the other the the one that the two students came in with uh, i asked them to uh read these articles about the political and social structure of the maya and um and they came in having that literally charted, picto charted, the political and social structure. And then again, we were able to compare because they were right there. This coffee and tea is one of their free <coughs> templates. Um, it looks a little weird if you try to take a coffee and tea template and apply it to something else like history or I, I assume biology. Um, but some of them are really good. Uh, all of the, I, I didn't have any of my students, all of my students used the free version. And then one of my students is so involved with it, she's doing it for her geometry work now. Um, somehow she's able to use their shapes in order to create mathematic equations and it's helpful for her geometry class. So she went ahead and bought a year subscription, um, which is not expensive. It was like 40 or $50 or something. So if you're using it for all your classes. But like the coffee versus tea, you could turn it into, um, for a political debate, this year's Republicans versus Democrats as far as platforms. So it shows you, if you click on that little thing right there, it, yes. it's amazingly, it's really quick. Just hit the start button. And you can see what they do. So I've tried doing the tea and coffee. Yeah, well, in this video, you can see for yourself. So, once you have signed up or logged in, go ahead and pick a theme. Go to the Picto Themes page and click Create to start editing. Name your infographic. <coughs> Hi, 
change the title and add text. You can change the background and add in icons or photos to make it more visually exciting. Change icons colors to better fit the palette of your infographic. You can see what you can Got some data? Visualize it by adding a chart or a map. We've done this. That's what we did population rise and fall and it was great. Finished? Now simply distribute the link. can publish your work on social media channels. So that's it. How do you like the new picto chart? Get in touch with us and let us know. I should have I tried the tea and coffee and I couldn't get rid of the picture in the background. Now I know what I was doing wrong. <laughs> so my, my big concern is always citation. Okay, so is there a is it is there an easy way to make to add the citations to that so that we're sure that the students are not just Yes. Taking so, somebody's data, putting it in a chart, and that kind so of thing. So what I did is I had them um, write a, re, uh, a sort of summary paper in addition to this. They did. They designed this, and then I uh, collected them and redistributed them, and they had to write an explanation of somebody else's picto chart. And with that, they had an opportunity to write all of their citations. But you can also add, at the bottom here, uh, all of these are a slide. Mm -hmm. So you can add another slide, slide. bibliography, citations, that sort of thing. Uh, and especially with this, you can make them hyperactive links within the PDF. Mm -hmm. Can you type uh, other languages in there? Uh, you should be able to, using PE in there or something. I'm just thinking how we can use it in, in the foreign language classroom. Right. Um, yeah, we have picked a chart. Can users from different locations work on one of these together? Not that I've seen. Um, there are similar things like uh, through Google Docs that you could do this. Um, but they weren't able to share it as an individual. Can, can you use that called flyer to the students? The flyer? Yeah. 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 They have a really yeah, they have clip art yeah, collection. Just, um, really amazing. But in addition to that, you can just Google image and add image. So uh, you know you you've got to be careful depending on how you use this. Uh, in education, we usually save from copyright stuff, but uh, if you're going to distribute, then you need to make sure you have the image. Um, so they just had a little quick like take a tour, and it shows you can add for this coffee versus tea one. You can click on the thing that says icons, and they all these they put in coffee, and they put in all these all these coffee images came in, and you can change the colors and stuff. It is really cool. It is really cool. I can see why the kids really love this. Yeah, and it's easy. I had a 40 minute class, and we did this in 40 minutes. Um, and uh, in that class, I have 17 year olds, and I have one 11 year old, and all of them were done by the end of the class. So it's more intuitive than you would think. And what's really great is you can create Q code. So if this were a flyer advertising something, you could then add a Q code at the bottom. So you have all these flyers all over the campus, and people, if, want, if they want more information or your website or whatever, they can use that. Were they? So have you used it mostly with each person creating their own? Yeah. Um, there could be collaborative tools. Uh, I suspect, especially if you end up paying for the subscription, there are a lot of other things that you get to do. I just haven't paid for it yet. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Yes, yeah, this. this is great. Um, well, technically, we have 45 minutes left. I don't think anyone will be bothered if we break early. Can you email? Uh, you, can you? Uh, can you give us your email or something? I, I like to have your PowerPoint. Absolutely. Um, so if you go on my website, yes. I have a contact form that goes directly to my email. Okay. 
But I think this is the most important conversation to get to. You can imagine how I felt as people slowly circled, trickled out. I'm like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> but there are so there are other sessions that we're starting. Um, oh, at, um, so I think some people like wanted to go to the assessment section or something. Yeah, yeah. Not, that makes me feel better. <laughs> you know, that's the truth because I thought about jumping yeah. up and leaving because it's the one about it's the assessment data yeah. for whether blended learning works. Which a lot of us. Yeah, are you want to go? To no, I'm going to sit here and learn pictograph. <laughs> <laughs> we have another colleague who can do this information, but I think some people, like they were told, you, you know, try to get some information on yeah. that. Yeah, right. Well, I did start with presentation stuff, so. Um, I, uh, I, right now I'm working with a math teacher trying to help her develop an online math component. Uh, some problem that a lot of schools have, especially small, small schools, their students have such dynamic ability or uh, varied abilities in math, but they have to take English 1, English 2, ninth grade history, 10th grade history. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> the room's given us a hint. Um, and so they're thinking about doing math online, and there are a number of really cool apps for that. So she's doing uh, like First, a written explanation, and then a video explanation, and then she'll create a visual so that you can watch a series of the, you know, if, if it's algebra, she'll, be, she'll start an equation and then show how you cancel it out, or uh, that sort of thing. So the students start that, they watch all of that information, and then they try a few uh, examples, uh, and she can, you know, grades those, and it's, it's been really cool to take something that I know nothing about, I'm terrible at math. Um, I mean, I can, you know, calculate the tip and stuff, you know, but uh, uh, when it comes to higher math, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, so it's been really cool to do stuff outside of my discipline and then show her how to scaffold it in a way that touches different learning styles. That's something that's what um, the, if you look at the schedule, the Fit W or the 60 people are yeah. doing, that's um, they're creating like just in time math modules for science students and, like, um, so that they can do stuff like that. And they're, like, they're running biology. Oh, that would be so helpful in chemistry. There are a lot yeah, of students exactly, who think, yeah. like, it's time for them to take advanced chemistry, mm -hmm. but their math is still exactly, exactly. Oh. Okay, there's a cheat sheet on PictoChart. <laughs> <laughs> it shows they have, it kind of breaks down their infographics layouts. They have the useful bait, the verses or comparisons, heavy data, roadmap timelines, visualized articles. So this is shows you what what kinds are best for your information. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can choose one of their templates and mess around with it. Uh, I'm also developing an online Chinese course entirely online. So I think there's a lot of challenges in farm languages entirely online. Um, do, I, do you have any suggestions for more interactive things I could do on no. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> have you used VoiceThread? Oh, yeah, voice, voice thread. So, my Mandarin teacher, Elsie or Shashuan, uh, likes to use um, voice thread where she gives them something to translate, and it can be a document, and you put a patch on the document and translate those three lines. And then when I click on the patch, I can listen to their translation, or I can read their translation, or I can read their translation as they speak it, and then I can give them feedback on their tonal pronunciation, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, can the beginners use that? Yes. Uh, VoiceThread um, yes. Voice yes. has, it, you pay for it, but it's not very expensive, like $49 for the year or something like that. Okay. So it's something that usually you can get your institution to pay for. Uh, but it's especially good online because the, the biggest drawback of learning the language online is that verbal you know, pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And with this, they can record all of their translates. So they're doing the translating work, and then they're speaking it, practicing it. Finally, they record it, and you give them feedback. Okay. Um, you give feedback uh, orally? Like you can record feedback so that they can hear you, or if you want it to be, okay, we're in your native language, I'll give you some advice. Um, and then, so let's say that you want it, so you have general advice, but they mispronounce three words. You can then add a patch to that advice and record those three words. Remember, it's, you know. And like yeah. you can record comments and stuff, you can record their face and stuff, because a lot of your students are like distant and vocal and stuff, so um, they don't think they can either type comments, voice comment, or face. 
She has been watching fairly simple children's shows sometimes uh, because that's the level of Mandarin, right? And um, and then they, so the, it's, the show is in Mandarin. She has them watch like an eight minute clip or something. And then they have to patch in and give their translation or a comment or she designs these interact. So it's a, it's a video, but they've patched in their voice thread. And so you can click on that or the students can click on that and see what they have commented. Um, Who's your teacher? <laughs> oh, her name is uh, Li Shashuan, and I can give you her contact yeah, information. She's really interesting. Um, we're doing a, a co-presentation next year at the National Association of Independent Schools on this stuff. Oh, so, okay. um, but yeah. In fact, if you email me with my uh, through my website, yeah. then I can just I'll have all that stuff and I can okay. forward it to you. Okay, thank you. Great. Do you have any other cool foreign language? I, you know, I I find myself, I, I used to run an intensive English program, so I used to use a, a lot of things, but I find myself here at Grim Lauren wanting, sort of stepping away more from more and more from the technology because the big challenge for most of my students is the face-to-face, -face, um, you know, real-time conversation in class. They can give presentations, like, you know, the best presentations in class. Um, the Online conversations are sort of flat, as I said, you know, yeah. but the, the real problem and the problem most of the professors here, you know, worry about is students just not um, participating in, in regular face-to-face -face conversations. So I really hesitate to add, it, it's always, it's hard for me because, you know, adding too much to what they have to do outside class is burdensome and 